Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Thank you so very much, Pandi, for that kind introduction. I have never met with uh, so many Indians <laughs> at one time. <laughs> and I apologize for being a Chinese. <laughs> and when I remarked to my colleague that so many people sign up for this event, he said, you should see Indian weddings. <laughs> uh, it's great pleasure. I'm humbly honored to be here to talk with you about my book, which is Out of the Gobi, which is a memoir about a particular period in the Chinese history, and quite recent Chinese history, which I and my peers lived through. And I think this part of the Chinese history is critically important. Without knowing about this part of the history, it's difficult to understand China today. I think that's true probably for every country. Uh, history informs the present and probably foretells the future. But telling this part of history or knowing this part of history would allow you to appreciate how much change there has been in China since that time. Let me go back to a traumatic period of time in the recent Chinese history called the Cultural Revolution. And uh, the first slide I would like to show to you is uh, this one. You see this gentleman standing side by side with Mao. And probably very few people recognize his face. And he was actually the head of the state of China. And on the left-hand side is the front page of the People's Daily on October 1st, 1959, the 10th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Liu Shaoqi was his name. He was the president of the country. Mao, in fact, was the chairman of the party, even though, of course, he was the paramount leader. Liu was the president of the country and the head of the state. And this was in 59. And in 1966, when I was just about to graduate from elementary school, then the Cultural Revolution started for the entire country of about, at that time, 800 million people. All the schools were shut. All the schools were shut. Middle school, elementary school, and universities were shut down. Initially, I was very happy. I thought we were going to have a vacation, a long vacation. And I didn't realize that this vacation would last 10 years. So for the next 10 years, I didn't see school. And none of my peers went to school. And this is what happened to the president of the country. He was dragged out of his residence in Beijing by red guards, and he was harangued, he was struggled against, and he was sent into prison without public knowledge, without any process at all. And a few years later, and this happened in 1966, just seven years after the first slide, and he was sent to prison, and three years later, in 1969, he died in prison, nameless, without anybody knowing about it. We didn't know about it until about uh, seven years later, after the Cultural Revolution. And that's what happened to the head of the state. And that will give you some idea, the chaotic period, the turmoil that we went through at that time. His wife was 47 years old at the time. She was too dragged out of her residence. And she was brought in front of 300,000 college students to be attacked verbally. And eventually, she was sent also to prison. And she was put into solitary confinement, again, without public knowledge, without any process at all, for 12 years. She survived the Cultural Revolution. She actually came out. But she didn't know that her husband long died uh, in prison. This gentleman in military uniform, was 
one of the founding fathers of the People's Republic. He was one of the ten marshals, and he was a leader in the Red Army, fighting together with Mao. And he was the commander in chief. He was the defense minister, by the way, in 1949, the first defense minister of China. And he was the commander in chief in the Korean War, leading the Chinese forces fighting against the Americans. And he fought the troops of the United Nations to a standstill at 38th parallel in Korea, which, as we know, stands today. So he made great contribution to the new China, the People's Republic, and、uh, as you can see, he was also photographed side by side with Mao. But in 1959, again ten years after the founding of the People's Republic, he got into trouble because in 1958 Mao launched what was known as the Great Leap Forward to rapidly industrialize the country, which led to The Great Famine in China between 1966 and 19,、uh, sorry, 1960 and 1962 for three years. The Great Famine, and during that period of time, as many as 30 million people died of starvation. Think about it: 30 million people died of starvation, which represented, by the way, about five percent of the entire Chinese population. There was a shortage of food. I was growing up at that time, and I remembered very keenly how my parents were starving. They tried to spare all the food for their children, but they didn't have enough to eat. And we were living in Beijing, and you can imagine the situation in the rest of the country. He criticized very mildly the policies of Great Leap Forward, and for that offense, he was purged. He was stripped of all his positions. He was exiled into Sichuan Province in 1959, and seven years later, when the Cultural Revolution started, and this is what happened to him: he was dragged back to Beijing by the Red Guards, and he was humiliated, brutally attacked, physically beaten, and eventually died in confinement a few years later. And that happened to one of the founders of the People's Republic during that period of time. And this gentleman was actually the father of Xi Jinping, and his name was Xi Zhongxun. Xi Zhongxun was the vice premier of China, and he got into trouble as early as 1963. And what did he do? He supported the publication of a book, which Mao considered to be a poisonous weed. So, for that offense, he was purged. He was put into confinement. He didn't come out until about 18 years later. I know how risky it is to publish a book,、uh, and that's what happened to him. So he went through a terrible period of time. Even though he was also considered to be one of the founders of the People's Republic, and so it was a period of time, entire country was thrown into chaos and turmoil. And Mao called upon all the Red Guards young people to rise up against the establishment, against the government. So all people in authority positions. All figures, whether in the government or in academics, or in culture, or in entertainment, they were attacked by red guards, and the entire country became an anarchy. So this is a photograph of Mao standing on Tiananmen Gate, waving to red guards, and he reviewed the red guards, starting from August the 18th, 1966, eight times during that year. He called upon the red guards. To go out of Beijing and spread the fire of revolution throughout the country, so red guards from Beijing went out to all parts of the country to spread the fire of revolution, and eventually the entire country became chaotic. And this situation lasted for about ten years. And the red guards 
eventually decided that they would fight with each other because they all wanted to show that they were more revolutionary than the other faction. So China descended into what Mao called a civil war. And uh, Mao actually called the situation as a full-scale civil war. And other than jet fighters and, and Navy ships, all kinds of weapons were used by Red Guards to fight with each other. This is what I was able to find on the web, a photograph depicting one scene of the violence, the fighting between factions of the Red Guards. On the, le on the left hand side is an artist uh, depiction of uh, you know, what happens after one of the fights. Hundreds of thousands of people died in fightings between the Red Guards. You know, many Red Guards were killed by each other. So by 1968-69, after three years into the Cultural Revolution, the situation became unattainable. Many young people, millions of them, had nothing to do. There was no school to go to because all schools were closed. There were no jobs. So people roamed around in the cities looking for trouble, making trouble, getting into fights. And uh, at that time, the entire country, you know, production ceased, schooling ceased, and it was a horrible situation. And even Mao thought that things were out of control. You know, he predicted that the great chaos would eventually lead to the great rule of the country, but chaos piled upon chaos, it became even more chaotic. So he came up with a quite brilliant idea. He decided to send all these young people to the countryside, to the most remote parts of China, in the name of reforming the countryside and to reform the outlook of the young people, to make them learn from the peasants, to learn about the hardship, to help transform the backward countryside into, I suppose, socialist paradise. And uh, so in 1969, he decided to send all the young people to the countryside. And I was, together with my peers, sent to the Gobi Desert. If you look at the map of China, oh, this uh, pointer, yes. If you look at the map of China, it's in the shape of a rooster. And Beijing is at the throat of the rooster. And the Gobi Desert is in the back of the rooster. You see this red dotted line, that's the Great Wall. In ancient times, China built this Great Wall to protect itself against the barbarians in the Gobi Desert, or the Hans, or the Mong Mongols. Right? So anything north of the Great Wall was not even considered part of China. It was considered to be the barbarian land. It was considered to be not inhabitable. So I was sent to the Gobi Desert together with my peers. In, 19, in 1969, altogether, 17 million young people of my age, I was 15 years old, were exiled or sent to the most remote, the poorest parts of China, to the countryside. 17 million people represented about 10% of the Chinese urban population at that time. Think about 10% of the entire urban population. In the past 10 years, China witnessed probably the most massive urbanization process in human history. As you know, you know hundreds of millions of people became urban dwellers from being peasants in the past. But 50 years ago, China experienced the most massive de-urbanization process, when 10% of the population, all the young people, were sent to the countryside. And uh, this is uh, the uh, terrain of the Gobi Desert when I first went over there. That's a photograph of myself when I was 15, when I was first sent over there. I took this picture to send to my parents to tell them that uh, I'm actually very happy here. <laughs> the reality, of course, is very, very different. And uh, the 
terrain was like this 50 years ago, and I can assure you that uh, it looks exactly the same today. And we worked day and night, years, on this piece of land in the hope of turning this land into arable land. I was chatting with somebody about uh, the geography of India, and I was told that arable land represents something like 40% of the Indian territory. I don't know if that number is accurate, but arable land represents only about 15% of the Chinese territory. So China doesn't have a lot of arable land, actually two thirds of the arable land of the United States, even though supporting five times as many people. And there are many places like this, you know, the mountains, the Gobi, and this is the Gobi Desert. We were told to transform this piece of land into fertile farmland and worked extremely hard day and night, bearing hardship to turn this land into fertile farmland. And eventually, our entire effort was totally futile. <laughs> and the land looked exactly the same today as it was 50 years ago. And uh, this is a photograph of myself chasing a bull in the Gobi. When I first arrived there, it gives you some other idea about uh, what the terrain looks like. Uh, one thing I learned when I was there is that when you see a fierce animal, if you try to run away, he will come after you. And that's very dangerous. But if you chase after him, he will run away. So when you see a bull, of course, you see many of them here in India. Uh, and I, they seem to be very docile. Uh, in the Mongolia or in the Gobi Desert, the bulls can be very ferocious. Uh, the best defense is offense. Uh, that's what I learned in the Gobi. My publisher turned this photograph into the cover of the book, but they doctored this picture and removed the bull and turned around the, the, uh, the angle so that I was running out of the Gobi as opposed to running into the spine of the book. But I like this bull uh, very much. So when we first arrived there at the age of 15, it was in September, late September of 1969, the weather was already very cold. And in Inner Mongolia, in the Gobi Desert, at that time, the temperature could be freezing. It could be below zero. And we discovered that there was no housing. There was no shelter for us to spend the night. And we had to dig holes in the ground to spend the night. And it was extremely cold in the hole, spending the night. And eventually, we built some housing for ourselves, some shelter for ourselves. And here's another picture of myself with a friend of mine standing in front of the huts that we built for ourselves with reeds and with mud. And that's where we spend the night. And in wintertime, the temperature was the same inside and outside because there was no heating. The only source of heating sometimes we get was burning cow manure, dried cow manure. And I don't know if you have ever had the experience of having to burn cow manure. They are not bad. And when dried, they burn without much smell, and they can last you know, five, seven minutes. And that was the only source of fuel that we had. We had to walk around the Gobi for hours and hours to collect a few pieces of cow manure and to burn them right before bedtime. And in wintertime, in the Gobi, the temperature at night would drop to as low as minus 20 or minus 30 degrees. And in that kind of temperature, to remove your clothes just to get under the cover is exceedingly difficult. So a little bonfire from cow manure was a welcome relief. So we would save this cow manure, and at night, we, we would burn a little bonfire to give us enough heat just to remove our clothes to get into cover. When I first arrived in America, I like to tell my friends, I discovered that when people disagreed with each other, they like to use the expression bullshit. 
And I would think to myself, that thing used to be very dear to me. <laughs> in wintertime, in northern part of China, typically peasants, farmers, take a break because the land is frozen, the crops are in, and there was not much to do in the fields. So people hibernate for about three or four months until the springtime. But we were not so lucky because we were organized like a military, even though we were not given the treatment of military uh, people. And uh, we had to march to orders. Whatever the authorities order us to do, we had to do. So in wintertime, we were ordered to march miles and miles to a frozen lake in order to cut reeds. And reeds grow on this lake. And of course, the lake is frozen over in wintertime. And we had to use this primitive tool to cut down the reeds to send to paper mill many, many miles away. And again, this is a photograph of myself cutting reeds. And this is back breaking job in deep winter, freezing temperature. And we had to work extremely hard to just meet with our quota. We were given a quota of half metric ton per person per day. And without finish, finishing the quota, you couldn't take a break. You couldn't go back to the camp. And uh, we had only two meals a day. The first meal would be about 8 o'clock in the morning, there was never enough to eat, and the food was terrible. And the next meal would be about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. Typically, at about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I would feel so cold inside and out, because by that time, you have spent all your energy working so hard on the frozen lake, and uh, you would have an empty stomach, and there was no food. So, but you have to finish your quarter before you could go back and wait for the food to, uh, to be served at 4 or 4.30. It was extreme hardship, and we did this year in and year out, every year for about six years. And you know, this is what we did. We'll bundle up the reeds, stack them up, and ship them to the paper mill. Not only hunger, but also thirst on that frozen lake every day. Because even though we were standing on millions of gallons of water, there was no water to drink. To get down to the water beneath the ice was too much of an effort. You know, when the lake is frozen three feet under your feet, it's very difficult to get to it. So the only way for us to quench our thirst was to dig out some right ice and suck on the ice. And I can tell you, in minus 20 temperature, it is almost impossible to <coughs> quench your thirst by sucking on ice. You know, your, your tongue would be frozen, your lips would be frozen. And what I did was to put a couple of pieces of ice in my pocket, and they won't melt because it was too cold. And I'll take it out from time to time to put in my mouth, and for a little while, just to quench the thirst. And, uh, and this is a photograph of, of ourselves uh, squatting around some ice that we dug out. And that's how we spent uh, our time. So it was extreme hardship that we went through. But to me, that was not the worst. The worst was, in my view, that we were deprived of education. For the entire generation, my generation, there was no schooling for 10 long years. I didn't completely give up studying, and I did read on myself, as Bhante just mentioned, but most of my peers didn't have the motivation. There were no books. All the books were banned, and, uh, and we were too tired to read. So most of my peers simply wasted their time. And after a day of hard work, sometimes we worked 12, 14, or 16 hours a day in the fields, we come back and there was really nothing, no energy left to do anything. And many of my friends are very, very talented, but they never got anywhere in life 
because the Cultural Revolution simply wasted their lives. They never were able to obtain education. Here's a picture of myself with a friend of mine by the name of Liu Xiaotong with a violin. This gentleman is so talented that he picked up any musical instrument, anything, after a few weeks without anybody teaching him, he would be able to play it. He would be able to play it beautifully. And he somehow got a violin. And after a few weeks, he was able to play this violin as good as the music that we hear from radio. You know, during that period of time, for entire China, life, cultural life, was very simple. There were only eight revolutionary operas called uh, example uh, revolutionary operas sponsored by Mao's wife. So the radio would broadcast those eight operas day in, day out. And so everybody knew the tune and the music, and he was able to play, in my view, as good as what we hear from radio. And he picked up an arhu, a Chinese musical instrument, accordion, a flute, um, a, uh, anything. You know, he picked up anything, he would be able to play it. And he's that talented. He's a very good painter. And he carves the Chinese seal. And he is just a multi-talented artist. If it had not been for the Cultural Revolution, I think he would be a very accomplished artist in China today. But the Cultural Revolution completely wasted him. And he never obtained anything beyond elementary education. So after the Cultural Revolution was over, then he couldn't find a decent job. And he still lives in poverty today. And many of my friends, most of my friends, live in poverty today because they never received an education and wasted their lives in, in the Mongolia. In fact, in the Gobi Desert, he got out of the Gobi by using his talent. Everybody wanted to get out. It was not possible to get out. And uh, he was able to carve a seal, a chop, on the sole of a plastic, the plastic sole of a shoe, uh, which looks exactly the same as the official chop. And he certified that he was too sick to stay in the Gobi Desert. So he was released, and he went back to Beijing. Of course, when he came back to Beijing, there was really no job for him. But that was how he got back to the city. And most people, of course, didn't have the talent to get out of that place. And I really feel greatly regret that uh, you know, many of my talented friends really couldn't make it in life uh, because they never had the opportunity uh, open to them. And he was one of them. And I have another friend whose name is Yi Kong. And as you can see, he's actually the older one <laughs> in this photograph. The younger one was myself. When I put this photograph together, my secretary looked at it and said, which one is you? <laughs> I, I suppose I come to his age now. But he was in his late 50s. And I was, of course, a teenager at the time. He was probably one of the first aviation pilots in the Chinese history. And his name was Yi Kong. And he served in the military, in the Air Force of the old regime, the Kuomintang government. And he was trained in the United States. During the war, the Second World War, and China and the United States were allies with each other. So some military officers from China went to America to be trained as pilots. And he trained in the Air Force. And he was also trained on naval battleships in the United States. But in 1949, in November of 1949, one month after the founding of the People's Republic, he and his comrades led 12 aircraft from Hong Kong to fly all the way to Beijing to defect from the old government to the new government, and therefore laying the foundation 
for Air China today. So they really contributed to the founding of the People's Republic. And he was a hero at the time. But during the Cultural Revolution, because of his background of being trained in the United States, of his connection with foreign countries, he was exiled to the Gobi to spend time together with us. I became a very close friend of his because I shared a few books with him. He would not dare to come into possession of any books, but you know, I was able to share a few books with him. We became very close friends. He was the first one to have told me something about things outside of China. And I still remember how shocked I was when he told me that uh, America was richer in 1940s than China in 1970s when I was in the Gobi. And that was a shock to me because I never knew that. I grew up believing that China was one of the most prosperous socialist countries in the world. And uh, we should feel very sorry for the oppressed people in capitalist societies even though at that time I was wondering, because we didn't have enough to eat, I was wondering how the oppressed people in capitalist societies would survive if we could hardly have enough to eat. But he really opened my mind to a world outside of China at great personal risk to himself. If I told on him, he would be in deep trouble. But he was the first one to let me know that there's world outside of, uh, of China. And eventually, he retired and went back to his hometown. And uh, I had never seen him uh, since that time. But I still remember all the things he told me about the United States and uh, other countries. So all these things came to an end in 1976, when Mao died, and the Cultural Revolution was over. And China, uh, came out of the Cultural Revolution, and many of the young people exiled into the Gobi or elsewhere were allowed to return to the city. And I went back to Beijing, and I went to a college to have studied for a few years before I went to America as a visiting scholar. Even though I never had a secondary education, <laughs> I hardly finished my elementary school at the time there were no educated people in China because for 10 years, there was no schooling. At the time, China was a mystery, especially to Americans. You know, Americans didn't know what was happening in China. So when I went to America as a visiting scholar, they assumed that I had some education when in fact I didn't. And uh, I went to San Francisco. I don't know if anybody recognize this lady, and she is Diane Feinstein. She was the mayor of San Francisco. So when I first arrived, you know, she held a party for us because I was from Red China, and it was very rare for somebody to come out of Red China to go to America. So I became quite uh, popular, and uh, many people come to see me, ask me about China. I felt like a panda uh, being watched. <laughs> And, and somehow, you know, somebody took this picture, and just two weeks before the book went to print, uh, somebody sent this picture to me. I felt very fortunate. And eventually, I went from there, from San Francisco to UC Berkeley, where I received my PhD. And uh, my professor at the time was Janet Yellen, who became the chair of the Federal Reserve System. She was very kind to have written a foreword for the book. So you should get the book. Uh, if you don't read the content, read her foreword. And among other things, she said, he had arrived at Berkeley to start his PhD program, and I was his academic advisor. I was stunned to discover that he had no formal math training. All the math he knew, he had learned by himself by candlelight. And, uh, by that time, it was too late. They didn't kick me out uh, because they never checked my credentials, which, of course, I didn't have. So I consider myself to have fooled my way through the American educational system. I got my PhD. I went on to become a professor at the Wharton School, where I taught for about six years. So that basically is a teaser in the parlance of investment banking uh, of, of my story.
and I'm happy to report that my book is, uh, has been selling pretty well. It was named as one of the best 10 by Financial Times for last year. And uh, it became a national bestseller in the United States. And somebody told me that Amazon would only put the best, best books in their physical stores. You know, Amazon has physical stores in America as well. And somebody sent me this photograph showing my book in the physical store. And I look at this photograph, I said, I'm not quite sure about the company I keep. <laughs> Although I must say that somebody seemed to have had much tougher life than I did. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is my story. And thank you very much. Well, Regent, thanks for that. That was just uh, exactly that, an incredible teaser. And I can only reiterate um, uh, what he just said. Uh, just read the book. It, it is epic. It really is epic. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's epic not only because of the sweep of what it covers, but because um, of the very personal experience. It's, uh, it's, it's based on a journal he kept um, going back to 1971. Yes. The journal before that he lost, unfortunately. But uh, it's just uh, uh, an incredible, incredible story. So I'm hoping that now you will be able to sell the film rights. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, I have been approached. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, uh, what I thought we'd do um, uh, is to divide this conversation into three bits. One that is a little personal. Um, second, your reflections on China from this. You've sort of alluded to um, some of those. And then the trickiest bit, um, try and do uh, uh, some kind of India-China comparison. This is, after all, um, uh, an Indian audience. Um, and you're the only Chinese in the room, are you? Yes. Uh, which is, <laughs> which <you>. is. <laughs> there was another one. Oh, there was another one. She left. <laughs> Your wife. Uh, uh, so, uh, first on the on the personal stuff, uh, Vijayan. Um, you know, we uh, uh, there is something about. Uh, I don't know if it's this generation of Chinese, um, or it's something else, but you know. One of the, the terms that kept coming up in the Cultural Revolution is the word uh, bourgeois, mm. bourgeois emotion. Yes. You cannot sh show emotion. You cannot uh, be inclined to poetry, to love, because it's a bourgeois sentiment. Correct. Right? And you yourself describe how you, had, you were forced to mask um, your disappointment or your elation yes. when you receive certain news, right? Yes. Um, is there, uh, so describe that, describe that to me. How, how has that affected you as a person, your relationship with your wife, your children? How is it different from your relationship with your parents? And how did this experience affect all that? It was a time when telling the truth would get you into trouble. It was a time when children would tell on their parents, and sometimes parents would tell on their children and get into very deep trouble. And the most horrific story I've ever read was a young girl beaten to death by the Red Guards because she was caught for putting the little red book of Chairman Mao under her butts when she was sitting on the floor. And her mother was forced to beat her until she was beaten to death. And you know, just imagine that. Uh, what horrible thing could happen to a parent? So people learned not to tell their thinking and their inner emotions. And yet today I was remarking to somebody that uh, 
in, in fact, uh, some reporters that uh, you know, Fukuyama wrote this book yeah. about uh, the trust level of societies. And he basically said that uh, Asia, by and large, with the exception of Japan, is a low trust society. And, and I told him that uh, China, in particular, is a low trust society. And that was extremely true right after the Cultural Revolution because people learned not to tell the truth. Telling truth will get, into, get you into trouble. And therefore, as an investor, you know, we invest in China as we do elsewhere, and we would like to make more investments in India. You would find that for a long period of time, fraud was a very prevalent problem. People learned not to tell the truth. And, and therefore, you not really- to, Not to report GDP numbers correctly. <laughs> uh, that's a little different. But, uh, uh, but then, so you have to be very vigilant when you invest in a country uh, like China. And uh, you have to do your due diligence. I think the situation is getting, or was getting better uh, when it became unnecessary to really hide uh, everything, but uh, it became part of the culture, a very damaging part of the culture. But, but tell me, uh, even before uh, uh, the Maoist revolution uh, in China, going back to this question of trust, wasn't uh, business, um, uh, the culture of uh, trusting each other, dependent on kinship groups? Right? Um, then you have this whole rupture, complete social re-engineering and breakdown. Um, what is now the basis of trust in Chinese society? If you look at the business world in the past 100 years, and if we go back to the country that you are very familiar with, which is Britain, the big businesses in the British history were all controlled by families. When they had far-flung colonies, they would send family members to manage overseas subsidiaries and because it was easier to trust a member of the family. Professional management really developed in the United States, especially after the war, because the country is so big. You know, America developed multinational companies. So it was not possible to either amass enough capital to build large <laughs> MNCs or to have family members to manage them. So professional management really came out from multinational companies in the United States. So I would say that historically, almost in any country, businesses were managed more by the family because there's a trust factor. And China is not an exception. And I think it's very similar in India as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that whole system has resurrected after the trauma of uh, the Maoist period, if you like? Well, initially, after the economic reform started in 1979, when Deng Xiaoping came back to power, really abandoned the old system under which all economic activities were controlled by the state and embarked upon economic reforms really to move the country in the direction of the market economy. Initially, private businesses are all or were all owned by individuals and their family members. Today, it's very interesting. Uh, professional management has become very rapidly spread in the Chinese economy and Chinese market. You look at all the large companies in China, whether it's Tencent, Alibaba, or all these large companies, they're typically managed by professionals. Why? because China is a very big market. You know, we invested in the company, which is today called Tencent Music Entertainment, mm -hmm. which is a streaming, music streaming business, very similar to Spotify. And uh, we invested about $60 million about five years ago to start this company. And today, the company is listed on New York Stock Exchange with market cap of $20 billion just in five years. How did we become so big? We have 800 million unique monthly subscribers. 800 million. <laughs> That's more than twice the population of the United States. And only in China, 
would you be able to get this kind of scale? But when you get this kind of scale, if you manage it with uh, just friends or families, it's not enough. You really have to have professional management. So today in China, the name of the game for entrepreneurs is really to be able to scale up, to expand, to expand, because otherwise you cannot compete. Everybody wants to expand. If the business model is successful, you can replicate it very quickly throughout the country. And for that, you need professional management. So now, family business is a rarity in China. By and large, large companies are professionally managed. Interesting. Second professional, um, personal question is, you know, you describe um, uh, a very, very, it's a riveting section in, in the book, uh, is when finally the Construction Army Corps is allowed to nominate people for college scholarships, right? Construction and, Army Corps was the name of the military type, semi-military type organization we were under at that time. So you That's were, why I said we were organized like a military. So he was part of the Army Corps, Construction Army Corps in, in Mongolia. Yes. And it was a very politicized process, a political process of selection of these candidates. Yes. And you came very close. Yes but you were denied. Hmm. Um, how did you deal with that disappointment? And since then, that experience, how has that shaped how you deal with disappointment later in life? Of course, when I was first denied of the opportunity to go to college at that time, it was extremely painful. I went through the election process. You had to get enough votes in order to be selected. And uh, I won the election, and yet the authorities denied my opportunity. And uh, I was desperate because we were told to take root in the Gobi Desert. There was no hope. We would spend the rest of our life in the Gobi, going to a college, was the only chance to get out of that place. And that opportunity was denied of me. And uh, I pretended to be very happy. <laughs> I smiled. I went on with uh, my work as usual. And I cracked more jokes than I usually did. Because if you show your bourgeois exactly. uh, emotions, uh, then you will never have a chance the next time. So I had to pretend that I was happy that I would spend the rest of my life in this place. And the next year, luckily, I was elected again. And this time, through a very complicated process, I was able to leave the Gobi. Had I not hidden my emotions at the time when I was first rejected, I would have been in deep trouble. I probably would have been in the Gobi Desert today. <laughs> So do you hide your emotions now? Uh, only with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Elegantly deflected. Okay, so let's... You know, the Chinese are not supposed to be very expressive <laughs> to show affections. <laughs> so if we could uh, now uh, pivot to uh, questions about China, this is a good segue into your reflections on China. One of the things that has uh, uh, always intrigued me is the psychology of managing um, uh, a movement like the Cultural Revolution, right? You saw, you describe a chilling um, vignette of uh, accidentally or uh, walking by, was it Beijing number 13 school? Yes. Good, where the principal was being beaten to death yes. by a bunch of young girls, yes. right? What is the psychology of people that you know, you grew up with people are all around you in Beijing, right, at that time, that were then driven to behave in this manner? In the month of August 1966, in Beijing alone, about 2,000 middle school teachers were beaten to death by their students in the name of revolution. 
They were all regards. They all thought they were doing the right things. They were attacking so-called class enemies, and they were attacking their teachers and the principals of their schools. So I was, I happened to be on the compound of this number 13 girls middle school in Beijing. And it was getting dark and I walked past a room when I heard some noises inside and I peeked into that room to see four or five girls beating an older woman. And the next day I learned that that was the vice principal of the school and she was beaten to death. And she was already bloody when I saw it. I suppose that uh, number one, teenagers are typically quite cruel. Uh, I went through that period of time. There was not much empathy, but they genuinely believed that they were doing the right thing to answer the call of the chairman to attack class enemies, even though Mao didn't you know, invite people to use physical force uh, against class enemies. But the atmosphere was such that uh, people felt justified. You saw even a marshal was beaten up. Even the vice premier was beaten up. And uh, the president of the country was beaten up. And his wife was abused. So that became very prevalent. And I don't think that teenagers even thought you know, anything about it. They just, they just did it. And it was the most horrible thing. So was it the case um, in retrospect that the uh, uh, Gang of Wars, uh, uh propaganda machine, was that effective and powerful that it had such a deep impact on so many young people? Not so much for that. At the start of the Cultural Revolution, the Gang of Four, that is Mao's wife and her followers, were not a Gang of Four as yet. And it was simply because Mao thought that China was becoming corrupt. And he thought that when a party seizes power after a period of time, then the power corrupts the party and the establishment. So he called upon, and, and you know, in Marxism, of course, there's great notion of uh, class struggle, and the entire history of mankind uh, has been driven, according to Karl Marx, by class struggle. So supposedly, after the socialist revolution, the ruling class or the oppressive class is overthrown. And supposedly, there will be no class uh, in the society. But Mao thought, even though physically the class enemies have disappeared, but ideologically, mentally, culturally, the class enemy was still there. And given the opportunity, they will come back because people have a tendency of wanting to make money. People have a tendency of uh, you know, want, wanting the old culture. The Confucianism was very much rooted in the Chinese culture. So he called upon the young people and the masses to rise up against the establishment, almost anything in the establishment. And it was simple as that. And then the rest of it was uh, spontaneous. You know, the young people thought they were just justified to wage a revolution. So now, now fast forward to today, given um, the power of social media, um, do you worry that the same type of control can be abused and used very effectively for a potentially a next generation of Chinese youth? In a society that had never gone through such trauma, I think that's possible. And you have seen that, in fact, in the past 10 years on the world scene in a number of countries. Social media became the trigger of mass movement in a number of countries. But China would be an exception. I think it would be very hard for that to happen in China. Why? 
there's a very interesting paradox. In the authoritarian system, few people criticize the government, but few people believe the government. So people have learned to be very skeptical. In a democracy, in my observation, many people criticize the government. And many people also believe the government, even the lies told by the government. It's very paradoxical. And the reason is that you live in the authoritarian system. You know information is controlled. You know there's propaganda. And you become very cynical. You become very skeptical. You tend to believe nothing that the government tells you. And you tend to believe whatever critical of the government. But in the democracy, there's a free flow of information. So you feel that you can make a judgment. And therefore, you, you tend to be less skeptical. So I think that it is very difficult for, uh, for the minds to be controlled in today's society because people learn to be skeptical. And in China, in particular, after having gone through that experience. That's a very interesting argument. Um, uh, talking about paradoxes, um, you know, there is this uh, uh, theory about governance. Um, uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party itself has used it quite a lot, that there is democracy and then there is centralization. So for a certain level of decision making, there is consultation. I apologize. No, no, please don't worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is consultation, um, and there is uh, there is consultation, uh, but beyond a point, then the decision is centralized. This actually in your in the decision that was made about your college appointment, uh, the same there was consultation. You were elected, but then the final decision was made by some functionaries, right? So you are applying that concept to how China is governed today. Uh, do you think that there will be a different path that China will show the world that, that, that builds on you know, the concept of accountability to the citizen, citizenry, which is similar to the mandate of heaven? Uh, it's a self-restrained autocracy um, that is consultative up to a point. Uh, but then makes decisions in the best interest of the nation. Um, and does that work for China? Or do you think that, um, you know, with all the emotional repression, lack of faith in the state, that, you know, as a lot of people expect, you will see an eventual democratic revolution in China? I think that China is not so different from other countries. There are differences from a historical point of view, if you think about the legitimacy of a government, the legitimacy of rulers, in the European history, the legitimacy typically came from one source, very simple, royal bloodline. Right? You have to have the royal bloodline to become a king or a queen. And, uh, and China is very different. In the Chinese history, you know, if you look at the English history, basically uh, the, uh, the, the one royal family, uh, more or less, one bloodline, has ruled kind of since the William the Conqueror, uh, Conqueror uh, with the exception of Charles I, who was beheaded, but then Charles II came to the throne. And the royal bloodline was really the source of legitimacy. But in China and in Japan, for you know, 2,000 years, there has been only one royal family. So royal bloodline in Japan is really a source of legitimacy uh, in history. But China, every few dozen years, or a few, uh, uh, you know, sometimes a few hundred years, there's a change of dynasty. There's frequent change of dynasty because royal bloodline is not a major source of legitimacy according to Confucianism. You have to have the virtue and without the virtue 
then it's justified for people to overthrow the ruler. And that's why there were frequent changes of dynasty. And in Chinese history, conquest was also a source of legitimacy. So Mao was, you know, if there were a general election in the 1960s, he would have been elected hands down. Today, of course, there's no election and there's no royal bloodline to speak of. I would think the only source of legitimacy comes from delivering economic performance, de delivering a higher standard, higher standard of living, which is very important. I think every Chinese leader is mindful of the fact that you will have to deliver economic growth. And uh, I think that is uh, really the driver uh, with regard to the leadership and whatever they do, whatever they think about doing. So you, so essentially, would it be fair to say that you believe that China has a way, another way, of delivering accountability than liberal democracy? Well, there's a way to be held accountable throughout the history. And uh, again, if you don't deliver virtue, you will be in trouble. But I think you're leading to a question about uh, whether or not the Chinese economic development is due to some unique China model that many people refer to. I don't actually believe so. I think that uh, China has developed very rapidly in the past 30, 40 years, especially in the past 30 years, not because of a unique China model, but because China embraced a market economy. 30 years ago, China's GDP was almost exactly the same as that of India. And China's per capita income was almost exactly the same as that of India. And today, China's GDP is five times that of India. And per capita income is about five times. You know, China's per capita income or per capita GDP has just passed $10,000 compared with about $2,000 for India. And what happened is China moved away from the Soviet model of central planning and moved in the direction of the market. And the Chinese people, like Indian people, are very industrious, are very entrepreneurial. So the freedom to build their business, to engage in economic activities, is responsible for where China is today, not some unique China model. Of course, the Chinese government uh, plays a role in the economic growth, especially in terms of building infrastructure. Uh, but uh, the major driver today is the private sector, which contributes to 60% of GDP, 70% of China's tax revenue, 80% of the urban employment, 90% of all the exports, and that's how important the private sector has become. And I think going forward, if China wants to continue to grow, it will have to support and develop the private sector. And that's the main driver of economic growth. So that's a good segue into the China-India India comparison. You know, I went to China the first time in 1989 um, to work on a project um, to modernize the People's Bank of China. Mm. I don't think people understand that as late as 1989. People's Bank of China is, is the central bank. Yes, RBI here. Is, is the equivalent of RBI, <laughs> right. right? That as late as 1989, monetary policy as we understand it was not feasible in China because every provincial government and branch of the People's, uh, People's Bank actually controlled its own money supply. That was in 1989. And today, you have the Chinese economy where it is. Uh, I had the privilege of you know, advising with the World Bank team, Zhu Rongji. Mm. And he was surrounded by people who had been through the Cultural Revolution, had been denied six, seven years of education, and yet were in the highest positions of economic policy making in the country. Yes. Now, this is where the comparison with India comes in, right? Uh, uh, 
you described so eloquently how a whole generation of people went without education. Yet, by 1989, the township and village enterprises had begun to take international markets by storm in their export drive yes. in manufacturing. Yes. Now, the traditional belief in India, I mean, in the public discourse here, is that, oh, you know, we must, uh, we must liberalize labor laws because they're too restrictive. That's the problem with Indian manufacturing. We are not enough, done enough for productivity of labor because our educational standards are very poor, right? From what you've described, the situation was in 1975. 14 years later, township and village enterprises are penetrating global trade at a very aggressive pace. What happened in China that India can learn from, um, aside from making it more market friendly, what other investments or interventions really helped? Education? That's a tough question because India, in my view, is better educated. You know, I spent many years as academic in America, the largest ethnic group among faculty members in top universities in the United States are the Jewish people, followed by the Indians. And uh, so I think that uh, on education front, of course, China was far behind in 1979 when economic reform first started. For China, I think the secret sauce was really by emancipating the productivity of people. I felt as though that we were, we were working very hard in the Gobi, as you saw, and we were working you know, 14, 16 hours a day, and yet we were not productive, and we couldn't even produce enough to feed ourselves. We starved all the time, and we were put into a cage. For example, we were in the Gobi. All of a sudden, in one year, the order came that we should grow rice in the Gobi. Think about it, northern part of China, because rice, according to our leaders, fetched a higher price in the international market than wheat. And we could hardly grow wheat in the Gobi, and we were told to grow rice. Of course, we were totally a failure. We were not able to produce anything. So I felt that we were put into a cage, and therefore, even though we could have done better things. We were not allowed to do so. What economic reform did in China was very simple. Deng, Deng Xiaoping didn't really have a plan. He didn't have a model. He didn't have a theory. He said two things. One is to cross the river by probing the stone under your feet, you know, one step at a time, so that you don't fall into the water. So it's just an experiment. The second thing he said, is doesn't matter if a cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice, you know, as long as it works. So I felt that the process of economic reforms was really just to open the cage, you know, to open the door of the cage so that people can be more creative. And eventually the cage was taken away. You know, initially you could start a business, but you can't hire anybody because that would be considered to be capitalistic. And then it's no more than five people that you can hire as employees. That's not as capitalistic as you know, if you become a real capitalist. And then there's no restriction anymore. So gradually, you just emancipated the population to engage in free economic uh, activities. If my knowledge of India is rather limited, but you went through <laughs> a similar experience of trying to borrow from the Soviet Union, and you went through a process of liberalization as well. But today, if you look at the Indian economy in comparison with the Chinese economy, and something is very striking, it's very surprising. Everybody talks about China having a large state-owned sector. The state-owned sector in China accounts for about 8% of the urban employment. And in India, I understand that number is more than 30%. Excuse me, formal, uh, all formal employment, even more than that, yeah. All formal employment. The state-owned sector, only about 
So the private sector is really the driver. I think that's one thing. The second thing I have more, uh, wondered about uh, India is infrastructure. You know, China has a system where land is owned, all the land theoretically is owned by the government. So if you want to build a road, if you want to build a dam, you know, like uh, Three Gorges Dam, the largest hydroelectric station in the world, they moved, they migrated one million people in order to build that particular dam, right? All the government did was to build another town and offered a better housing and one million people moved because they didn't own the land anyway. And so if there was a better place for them to live, they would just move. And in India, you know, when you pass the law, Land Acquisition Act, 75% uh, of the people will have to agree to be moved. And then you will have to pay four times fair market value. Now, in the United States, there's a concept of eminent domain. As long as you pay fair market value, the government can condemn a piece of land for public works. So without building an infrastructure, it will be very difficult to really get the economy to take off. And arguably, China has overinvested in infrastructure. China now has the biggest, actually a bigger high-speed railway system than the rest of the world combined. And China now consumes 70% of all the electric cars that the world produces uh, because it has built a very large uh, infrastructure, roads and bridges. 80% of all the 80 of the 100 biggest bridges in the world are in China. And uh, so the infrastructure, I think, is, is clear, something yeah. very important yeah, for yeah. economic development at certain stage. Mm. Yeah, you shouldn't get me started on infrastructure. Uh, it's a <laughs> tale of woe. But yeah, I, and I, uh, I think I 100% agree with you. But I wanted for the audience to also draw attention of, and your experience of it um, in health and education. Yes. Um, you know, people don't know, but uh, Weijian was a barefoot doctor. Um, and uh, so we are we are experimenting with Ayurveda and you know uh, Ayush and all of that. Uh, there is a lesson. I, so, I call myself a quack doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I wanted to get to. So in today's healthcare system in China, which has evolved a lot, yes. what is the learning or use that uh, uh, you got or the Chinese got from the experience of barefoot doctors? That system has pretty much collapsed after the Cultural Revolution. Of course, there was great lack of medicine in the vast countryside in China at the time. Basically, there was total absence of medicine in the Gobi Desert. So young people were there, and they were sent to, some of them, like myself, were sent for very basic training, and then came back to become so-called barefoot doctors because in certain part of China, people go to the fields, the rice fields, barefoot. And these doctors would work during the day with peasants and come back at night to practice medicine. And it filled, it filled a need in the countryside because there was absence of medicine. But when the Cultural Revolution was over, everybody went back to the city and that system collapsed. The system collapsed because it was a forced system. It was not voluntary. And nowadays, if you receive a scholarship from a medical school, you will be obligated to serve two years in the countryside, and that was okay, and people would volunteer to go. And now China, in the past 10 years, have made a lot of progress in healthcare. And by the end of this year, I think at this particular point, China has basically met its target of providing universal health care uh, throughout the country. And, uh, and, and China has targeted to eradicate poverty by the Chinese definition by the end of this year as well. So there has been a great progress, but uh, there's a lot of complaint about the health care system. There's a very popular movie in China, which has a lot to do with India. Supposedly, uh, there is you know, uh, leukemia is incurable disease, and there's particular medicine that would help 
with this particular disease, but it's too expensive as sold by MNCs, new pharmaceutical companies. And then people discovered that uh, there's generic version in India and started to smuggle the medicine to China, uh, which of course was illegal, but uh, there were enough patients that the organized movement eventually allowed this medicine to come into uh, China. So there's a lot of complaint about uh, the costs of medical care. There's still copay. So if you have a major illness, uh, it could be very costly. It could ruin your finances for the family. But uh, by and large, nowadays, uh, medicine is provided for, for the entire population. When I first went to college, one out of probably 10 million people were allowed to go to college. So education was very much lacking. Today, arguably, <laughs> there was an uh, oversupply of college education. And there's no really blue collar unemployment in China. There's a shortage of blue collar workers in China. But there is unemployment of white collar workers, college students who find it very difficult <laughs> to find a good paying job. So China has made a lot of progress uh, in both of those regards. I think we can carry on uh, indefinitely, but thank you so much for this. I think it's time to open up the conversation um, to the floor. Um, so if you have any question, please identify yourself. And what we'll do is we'll take two, three batches of three questions each. Yeah. So we'll start with um, someone. Um, good evening. You talked about um, Chairman Mao's concern about the corruption of power um, and the consequences it led to. My understanding is that uh, President Xi Jinping has been concerned equally about corruption, and that was part of uh, his campaign against Bo Xilai. Um, so, uh, A, uh, how has he been able to, as it were, contain this in a way that Mao was not able to do so? And secondly, how, how has his anti-corruption campaign uh, affected China? Should I just address the question when it arises? I think it might be more efficient to just do two or three than uh, okay. other two. One Hi. more. Yeah. Prashant Kemka from White Oak Capital. Uh, how is Mao regarded in uh, modern-day China today um, in Chinese society? Uh, so at home, amongst family members, is he perceived differently, regarded differently between uh, different generations? And uh, uh, what is the uh, schooling or the history in school? What does that uh, teach about the Cultural Revolution and Mao? Is that different from the reality you experienced? Thank you. With regard to the first question, under Mao, there was no corruption as we consider corruption today. When Mao talked about corruption, it was a reference to a different thinking. And that is, if Deng Xiaoping was thinking about the market economy, and Mao considered that to be a deviation from Marxist theory, and he considered that to be corruption. What was happening in the Soviet Union, he called revisionist, and that was considered to be corruption. But in Mao's time, China was very clean because there was really no way to be corrupt in China. Everything was rationed, and everything was allocated, and the country was very poor. It was, you know, there was abuse of power, but there was no chance to make money. Corruption really came with the market economy. And Mao uh, Deng famously said that uh, you know, when we introduce market economy, it's like open the window and then a few flies will come in. What happened was that initially, you know, under Mao, all the resources were allocated, not by the market, but, but by the government. So there was no market. And therefore, it's impossible to be corrupt. And when economic reform started in China, China developed a so-called two-track system. There was 
official allocation of resources, let's say steel or aluminum or copper, and there was also a market where you can buy and sell the resources. And typically, the resources allocated by the official track were priced at a nominal price, very, very low. But the market price was four or five times uh, as high. So if you were a government official, you just sign a note and give that quota to somebody who can just sell it in the marketplace. And that arbitrage gives rise to corruption. And corruption is caused, in my view, there's a systematic, not systematic, systemic source of corruption, and that's power. If the power controls resources in the market economy, that's what causes corruption. So in today's China, before Xi, corruption became rampant. And, uh, and Xi did make a great effort to crack down on corruption, which I think is a popular thing to do. But in my view, you need to root out the systemic cause of corruption, which is the power that controls the resources, which means that China will have to downsize the government. The government is still too big. It controls too much resources. So we'll have to move more and more in the direction of the market. It has to allow the private sector to develop. And therefore, the resources controlled by the government will become smaller and smaller. So the government has made a goal to make the market a decisive force in the allocation of resources. And that will be the fundamental way to get rid of corruption. Before that, I'm afraid corruption will continue to exist, regardless how harsh measures, or how many harsh measures they adopt to fight corruption, which are necessary, but it's not going to root out the problem. Mao is viewed differently by different people. I think that the intelligentsia of my generation would view Mao very objectively. Uh, you know, he did do good things back in history in wars against Japan, Japanese invasion, and in founding the People's Republic of China. But after that, he committed the crime against the Chinese nation by adopting all these policies which starved the people, which impoverished uh, the nation. So intelligentsia, of course, fully understand it, and all of us lived through it. But uh, he's still very much revered uh, in China. Uh, I, I suppose for the good things that uh, he did, uh, as well as uh, you know, the Chinese uh, culture uh, needed uh, somebody to uh, worship. I'll come to you in a minute. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Pushpa Shah. I would like to ask you what are the measures or reforms would you like to suggest to increase India's productivity? To what? Increase India's productivity. Oh, India's productivity. Oh. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a couple more. There's a, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you an easy question. Huh. Firstly, uh, thank you so much for giving us a bird's eye view into your incredible journey. But you spoke about the first half of your life, the first initial parts of your life, right? If I look at what I've read about you in the second half or second phase of your life of being an incredible and successful investor, talk to us about how does one become a successful investor? <laughs> uh, how to increase India's productivity is not the question that I should answer. <laughs> I'm an investor. And uh, my experience is that uh, Capital really helps increase productivity. In my book, I referred one episode, one particular experience when I was a brick maker. <clears throat> Making brick is the most back-breaking job that you can ever imagine. From mud, from clay, from sand, from water, and eventually baking brick is the hardest job that you could imagine. We tried, or I tried, to build a machine to make bricks as opposed to manually. We needed, at that time, 3,000 yuan in order to make that machine. 
and eventually we were not able to find that money. And by my calculation, a machine would do all our work within 20 days when we spent 200 days working on that brick field. Right? We didn't have the capital. And if we had the capital, we would have the productivity. So I think that capital is very important source of enhancing productivity. And uh, I'm so glad that India is a market which welcomes foreign investments. And that's why we're very committed to investing in India. <laughs> With regard to my <laughs> uh, life after the Govi, it's actually not worth talking about. <laughs> my, uh, my book is not an autobiography. It's not about myself. My purpose of writing the book is really to tell that part of the Chinese history which I lived through, which people of my generation lived through, which I think is very important for us to remember, which would allow us not to forget history and not to repeat history. When I first finished and submitted my manuscript, submitted it to uh, the publisher. My book ended in September of 1975, the day when I got out of the Gobi. And that was the end of my book. So the publisher, of course, reviewed the book and uh, started to edit it. And then towards the end, he called me. He said, Shan, people will be curious what happened to you after the Gobi. You can't just finish there, leaving people hanging. Uh, obviously, you survived, but uh, you know, how did you become where you are today? So in two weeks, I added five chapters to talk about you know, what happened to me after the Gobi. So my book used to be 17 chapters. Now it's 22 chapters. And in the five chapters, I ended in 1993 when I left the Wharton School to go to Hong Kong to get into business. After that, I think it's even worth less to talk about. <laughs> and again, I, I hope uh, you, know, you don't consider this to be autobiography about myself. It's really about that part of the history that I, as I witness, or as somebody living through that experience, tell credibly about how it felt. Uh, to be in that history. If, um, do you have time for one more round, uh, or should we call it? We, we have two hands and two yeah. ladies, so we'll so have we, to accommodate we, we, them. This is you, and then you, and that'll be, we'll put an end to the question answers. I did read that you have two children. Uh, what stories do you tell them, and what do they like? most about? Do you tell the story uh, of the history and what, of, what do they like the most? What is their reaction? To my children. Calm manure. Calm manure. <laughs> yes. They like that part the they best. Like <laughs> so they know all that you've gone through and you shared with your children. They really encouraged me to write the book. Oh, they did. Okay. Because when they were small, I would tell them the hardship that we went through so they could better appreciate what they have today. But the lesson that I tell to all the young people, and I have a colleague here in the hill, and I met Fortuny and his wife, Mala. There are two sons. One is nine years old, the other is 11 years old. They both read my book, and I was very touched by it. I think that in our generation, we were denied the education. So education came to us as a privilege. And therefore, I appreciate it very much when eventually I was allowed to go to college. And I studied extremely hard in order to make up the 10 years that I had lost. In today's world, children take education for granted. They should, because they are all given the opportunity for education. But once you take something for granted, you tend not to treasure it as much. And therefore, I try to tell my children to treasure what they have, because they shouldn't take it for granted. Once upon a time, it was not so available. 
and I was denied such an opportunity, and many of my friends didn't really survive the Cultural Revolution in the sense that they never got educated. So they should appreciate what they have today. There's another question. Thank you. I think you just answered my question. Thank oh, you. lovely. So I think this is a wonderful note on which to draw this evening to a close. Weijian, thank you so much. It's really been a privilege to have you. And I really hope that your film rights come through and we can enjoy the film. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you very much. <laughs>